in one person's eyes, they might look at your life and say, oh, you've been so successful. Look, you've done this, this, and this. And the schema will say, yeah, that's all well and good, but you didn't do this other thing. And remember, yeah, you did it, but you were terrified while you're doing it. So that doesn't really count. Um, it always has a reason why it wasn't good enough. And when you're working with a schema, particularly one that has to do with any kind of self-criticism or um, kind of putting yourself down, I always look for what is the emotion behind it. You know, what drives the schema emotionally, not, not trying to dissuade it through logic because that you know, virtually never works, or it works as long as you're thinking it, and then it, you know, evaporates when you're in the heat of the moment. But if you think about what is the feeling that's associated with it, I always think of it as I'm not worthy, I'm not powerful, I'm not enough, um, I didn't do it well enough. Those are sort of the, the feelings of inadequacy and powerlessness that are in the schemas that cause us the most problems in life. So I might, instead of arguing with you about whether your schema is objectively true or not, um, Although, you know, it's a good thing to cover that at least, but I'm just, I'm just saying it's, it's a bucket with a bunch of holes in it. It doesn't hold water very long. You have to get at the emotion underneath. And if it's an emotion like feelings of helplessness, um, inadequacy, uh, low worth, those really need to be faced full on and acknowledged because that's where you want to ask yourself the question, where did I learn to feel this way? And then you ask yourself, what purpose did this serve in my growing up years? You know, like, what was the purpose of feeling this way within my family system? And it probably has to do with something that kept you safe. If you were powerless and inadequate, someone else got to feel powerful and competent. If you didn't feel like you ever did things well enough, you might consider that maybe there was somebody around you who needed to look down on somebody, even if it happened to be their own child. So you have to get at the feeling first to identify it. And then you just have to assume that you're feeling that way within that schema, within that, that understanding of life, that little pattern. You're feeling that way for a very good reason. You're feeling something that served you at a time in your life when you were very small and when you felt very unsafe, okay? And you need to go back and trusting that idea, find out how in the world was it to your advantage to make yourself so small? Yeah, um, I think we all have to be scientists. We all have to have the curiosity of a scientist and the courage of an experimentalist. So experiment, take a risk. I mean, the worst that can happen is that maybe it wouldn't go well and, you know, question answered. You can, if, if it keeps coming up for you, what I would do is talk with someone that you trust about it, but, also to write down why it could be that you're feeling this urge to reconnect right now. And we're not doing that to, you know, kind of 
put you in a court of law under cross-examination where you have to, you know, tell the whole truth and we're going to get to the bottom of this matter and they're going to be guilty or you're going to be. No, we're just trying to get our feelings on paper and our wishes and hopes. You know, is there a healing fantasy in there? Are we perhaps hoping that now that we're feeling a little bit stronger, that we might be able to handle it differently this time? I mean, whatever it is, we want to approach this kind of question consciously and in full awareness of our emotional state and our fantasies about what will happen. So when you approach the question in those ways, you begin to get a sense of, you know, I'm scared to do this, but I want to do this, so I think I will do this, or it might go to, you know, I'm feeling pressure to do this. I'm feeling like I ought to do this. I'm feeling like, you know, gosh, it's been six months, it's been a year, you know, whatever the sort of little uh, flag is that comes up in your mind, you know, that the little flag on the calendar that says, hmm, you know, it's been 18 months since you've spoken to them. But when that comes up, maybe that is not necessarily a good reason. Maybe that is some kind of, you know, left brain sort of, um, you know, counting out the the <clears throat> days and months, and it's it's saying, uh, don't you think it's about time? But you answer that with, I'll decide what time is enough. I'll decide when I feel like it, because if I go into something this delicate after all this time, you know, of, of estrangement, and I'm not feeling it then I'm going to be off balance. I have a higher likelihood of being defensive. Um, and that's not a good way to go into any kind of uh, encounter like that. So I would never recommend that just because of the amount of time that's passed or because, um, you know, they, a person thinks that uh, you know, it's okay to do that for three months, but somehow it's not okay to do that for a year. I mean, if there's that kind of made up rule, <laughs> because there are no rules about estrangement, um, but if you find one of those little made up rules in the back of your mind, then you bring it out into the daylight and you question it. Like, is that true? Do I feel ready to do this? Yes, it's been a year. Yes, it's been 18 months. Yes, it's been six years. Uh, but how am I feeling about this now? Has my life been going well without this contact? What will this contact bring me? How will it serve my purposes in life in terms of my recovery from, you know, whatever it may be that has, that has troubled you, like anxiety or feelings of inadequacy or, you know, depression, uh, any of that. Or maybe you just find that you have more joy in your life when you're not dreading the next holiday where you have to have forced contact. So um, I encourage you to think all of this through in a very conscious way and then go into it the way you go into a cold swimming pool, you know, kind of one toe at a time. Decide, given the situation and given your feeling, uh, actually given your feeling of strength, how strong do you feel going into this? How connected are you to yourself? Because if that's all in good shape and you think that you can stay connected to yourself if you go back into the relationship, then you may decide that you want to experiment and see how it goes. But you want to do it, like I said, like one toe at a time. You don't go on a, a two-week um, vacation 
uh, with them with no escape uh, for your first time out, you would think of what would make you comfortable. And we run through that by asking literally, how would you initiate the contact? Would you feel more comfortable with chat? Uh, would you feel more comfortable with an email, a handwritten letter, phone call? I mean, you get to decide how you want to contact the person. And if it progresses well enough that you want to see the person, why not try a very short visit? And people say, well, you know, if I'm going to travel all that way, I need to stay at least a week. Like, no, you don't. You can do something else for the rest of the week. You, you can pick the amount of time that you think you can stay connected with yourself. Because that's what really makes these visits um, so painful is that feeling uh, that I not only am not enjoying being with this person, but I find myself feeling like I have to be something other than who I really am. Okay. And when you start feeling that, that means that your connection to your own self is slipping away. And you need to figure out how you're going to get yourself out of that situation and into a space. It may just be sitting in your car in a parking lot, um, or it may be going back to your hotel room, but someplace where you can reconnect with yourself uh, until you can feel like, yes, I can be me again, and then try again. Um, you know, this is all within one very short visit. Uh, but yeah, someone's saying do a full inner check. Absolutely. That full inner check is allowing you to see, am I still able to hear myself inside? Am I still able to know what it is that I'm feeling? The narcissistic personality is very interesting because they really seem to enjoy conflict. Now, I don't know if they do or not. I mean, maybe that person is miserable doing that. But they sure seem to create a lot of um, tension, conflict, um, criticism, uh, control. And when you're on the receiving end of that, it's very hard not to get reactive. But not only with these personality types, but with any kind of unpleasant personality type, you really want to try to stay in a, in a observing, objective mode. You want to narrate to yourself inside, oh, this person just made fun of something that's very important to me or um, this person uh, just actually didn't even respond uh, when I asked them a question. Huh, I'm observing this. You know, it's like, I'm an anthropologist. I'm visiting this strange tribe. You know, this is what these people do. Interesting. I can remain objective and I can stay centered within myself and connected to myself while this is going on, and I can get through this visit or this encounter. Um, and, you know, my life, my life will go on. <laughs> um, I don't have to, uh, you know, keep hoping that I will find the magic answer because what's the magic answer to someone who doesn't want to listen to you? What's the magic answer to someone who wants to fight? What's the magic answer to someone who doesn't even notice or care that you're there? Is there a magic answer to that? I don't think there is. I think it is what it is, okay? And you have to be okay with that. Um, but you can't be okay with it, of course, as long as you are emotionally reacting as if hey, I don't like this reality. I don't like the way you're always looking for conflict. 
I don't like the way you're not paying attention to me. You're not being responsive. I want the situation to change. Well, you know, go for it. Do everything you can to make the situation change if that's what you want to do. Uh, you can tell them how you feel. You can express yourself. You can ask them what is going on that every conversation turns into an argument. Y you can try that and see what happens. Be an experimentalist. Take a risk. Of course, do that. But if you've already done that and the writing's on the wall, please turn back to yourself and please turn back to your own life with people who really are safe and they are people who will respond to you and make you feel glad that you made the effort. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to bring Hasna up to speak. I shared a question. And then Jennifer, if you still have a question, I'll bring you up next. And anybody else you would like, uh, just put your hand up and we will bring you up. How might one reconcile the constant grief that seems to come up when memories resurface? If anybody uh, has not seen the movie Wind River, there are two fathers. Um, both of them have lost uh, their daughter, their young women daughters. And the one who lost his daughter a long time ago is, you know, kind of counseling his friend who just, just lost his daughter under tragic circumstances. And it's just the most beautiful advice. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can paraphrase it well enough, but he in effect says something. And, you know, my apologies to Taylor Sheridan, the director, if I, and screenwriter if I get this wrong, but his advice was, he said something like, you know, you're gonna feel like pushing this down so far away from you to stop the pain. And you have to be aware of that, that that's a normal response to, to push it down and push it away. He said, but if you push it too far down then, and you let the, uh, the anger and the resentment and the, um, you know, the, uh, the tragedy of it. Uh, he said, if you don't feel that, he said, you know, like feel it all, you're going to lose the good memories too. And he said, you'll never, he said, you will lose her twice. When you get rid of your grief, and, and your, um, uh, your pain, you know, by not feeling it, by deadening it, you also will get rid of your emotional memories of her as well and lose her twice. And <laughs> like, you know, like almost sobbing. I mean, it was so beautiful, but it was so true, right? So, so what you're saying, Hasna, is that when you went down and kept going down into uh, the tr your true feelings, which is, is what the true self is made up of, is these feelings, the, the, the real experiential side of yourself. When you go into that, you will feel what's there. And just like in the movie, if there's grief there, you'll feel that. But if there is goodness there, if there's happiness there, if there were good memories, you'll find that too. You just don't get to pick and choose. You know, this is not the dollar store. You're not shopping for the feelings that you want to have. You are accepting that whatever it is that you feel is legitimate and it's important and you ignore it at your own risk. Because when you ignore your feelings, sooner or later, you're going to get symptomatic because the true self will not stand for that. Now, sometimes people say, I can't stand the feeling. It's too much. I feel like I'm going crazy. And of course you do, because at that moment, the feeling is bigger than you are. And that's why you need to have someone in your corner who can allow you to visit those places, visit that grief, who's not going to pressure you at all about 
how long are you going to stay down here? Um, how, uh, how long is this going to be a thing for you? When are you going to get better? Okay. When you can go to someone who can let you fully feel it, at the time, it doesn't feel like you're getting better very fast because there's so much grief and pain to process and it can take a long time. But let's look at what it looks like after you have processed it because I think there's a lot of misconception about this. It doesn't look like everything is tidy and put away and uh, you can look at these um, memories and, you know, and not flinch, not shed a tear. That's not what we're after. What we're after is expanding your true self to be large enough to hold all of this. Now, when we're little children, if we have an emotionally mature parent, the parent steps in and holds that for you. You can fall to pieces. You can be overcome as a little kid. It can be too much for you. But man, if you've got an emotionally mature parent who wraps their arms around you or looks you in the eye with a face that lets you know that you are not alone, that they get it, that they understand, and they're holding you in their heart. When that happens, the grief is shared with another person and it makes it bearable. Meanwhile, you are growing and that child is growing. They're getting a little bit better each time at visiting that grief and integrating it into uh, the personality or into the, <laughs> really it's into the mind and into the heart. So if we arbitrarily decide that we've spent, you know, three years in therapy grieving this and that ought to be enough, it's like, how do you know what's enough? You don't. Yeah. So um, let's see, there was one, there was one other, uh, oh yeah, about, about expanding yourself. Uh, one of the ways that we expand ourselves in grief is through crying. Um, I think it's Daniel Siegel in a, um, let's see, it was, a, it was an anthology of healing through emotion um, he wrote a, an article or a chapter in that book. Um, and what he said was that he's convinced that there is a neurological hookup in the brain between brain integration and tears. That when we're trying to take something in and we're trying to come to grips with it, and grief is certainly you know, a huge experience and it's often too big for us. So we have to, you know, keep making, you know, sort of running, running passes at it. But as we are integrating it, coming to grips with it, the tears are the sign of the integration. So, you know, when people who are grief stricken, um, feel like maybe they shouldn't be crying so much. It's like they're saying, well, maybe I shouldn't be letting my brain integrate this so much. Uh, I don't think any of us want that. <laughs> I mean, that's not, a, that's not a good end goal. Um, the idea is that we are going to expand ourselves to be large enough uh, to hold all the big feelings that we have. And people who grow up with uh, adequately emotionally mature parents, learn from the parent that it's possible to let go, find a, a safety net, or maybe we should say find a safety net, then let go, um, and we can return to ourselves having visited the grief 
you know, as, as deeply as is affecting us. And we can return from that enlarged, bigger, more able to uh, deal with what's, go what's, what's happened to us and also closer to our truer self, which is a huge bonus. But you, you just don't get a choice in terms of whether or not you deal with it. You deal with it consciously or you deal with it unconsciously. And of course, you know, as a therapist, I just invite everybody to consider uh, taking the conscious route. In parenting, if you, if you had an immature parent and then you become a parent, to sort of have this phenomenon over and over again as your children grow, and then you have this kind of overwhelming evidence um, that, oh my gosh, you know, my mom wasn't there for me in that way, and it's so clear that I have to be there for my kid in that same way. I know that so many people experience that. Um, you know, here you are with these uh, young people, uh, and you are, you know, you have a front row seat to their, um, their emotions, their needs, how things affect them, how incredibly sensitive children are, um, how big of an impact parents have on them, you know, anybody, but you know, parents are special. <laughs> and so they have a huge impact um, on their children. And you also know firsthand how much attention children really need. I mean, it's unreal. Uh, they need that interaction. They need that interest. They need that attention, like we need air. You know, that mom, look at me. Uh, that is them building a self. That is them becoming a person. And if you resonate with that in an empathic way, uh, you want to respond to it because they are so genuine about all of that. and they're. They're also, you know, in, the, in their um, best sort of way, so shameless, you know, about reaching out for the attention that they want. And so, of course, as you're having that experience with your child and you are maybe giving them something that you didn't get, of course, that is going to take you back to your own experience, you know, that especially if you feel good about it, like if you're conscious of um, your child's need and you give it to them and then you see how uh, positively your child responds to the attention, then you are going to feel good about that. And then right on the heels of that, you're going to feel like, wow, that's not the response I would have gotten from my mother. Or, you know, my dad would never have stepped in to help protect whatever. Uh, when I was growing up, that all of that travels together. So I think we just need to really accept that because you know, it's just like we we're talking about with how these memories get linked, um, you know, and if we, if we push down the bad memory, we also push down the good memories. And so when we realize how important this is to children, and then we, like I say, right on the heels of that, we realize how we didn't get it. That's one complex situation emotionally. And again, the idea is that self-enlargement, like yes to both of them, yes to your feeling of I'm able to give this to my child, I feel wonderful about that, you know, it's like yay mom, um, and oh my god, imagine 
what would happen inside them if they got a response like I got, which you know might actually not have been a response, it might have been neglect. Imagine what that would do to them. You could just you know imagine their little faces if if they didn't get treated with the kind of love that you're giving them. And it's a huge emotional thing, you know? But the important thing is that we're not growing away parts of ourself that get very complex, very contradictory. We try to say yes to this and yes to this and enjoy the fact that we are large enough beings that we can contain it all because it's all you know, like part of your truth, and it's part of your life. And you may not have realized exactly how incredibly um, painful what you went through or what you didn't get has been for you until you have this other life to compare it to. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that the, the most important thing is that you want to be observing your own process enough and feeling all of it so that it can be integrated in a, a real kind of way, because that's, that's what growth is all about. I mean, I neglected to say that on the last question, but what integration is all about is growth. You know, um, there was a, a child psychologist, um, uh, Jean Piaget, who looked at how children learn things um, and how they advance in their development. And of course, there's learning, there's taking stuff in, right? But then the child has to, um, take apart what they already learned that isn't complete, of course. They have to kind of take it apart to let there be room for the new stuff to come in. And then they integrate it, put it all back together, and now they've got a more complex, more integrated understanding of life. But that's the way it goes. It's like, take it in, um, deconstruct yourself enough so that you have room to put the new stuff in, go through a little period of discombobulation while you're doing that, and finally you integrate it at a higher level. That's what the integration does. Now you have the new thing. You are the new thing through that process of integration. So that's, that's the way I look at it is if you can feel it and integrate it, then you hopefully can take pleasure in the difference that you experience between what you experience and what your children are being uh, given by you. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. If anybody has any uh, last minute questions, please put them in chat. You know, when I hear people identify themselves as a rebel, I think of it as a person who has a lot of energy um, and who is willing to be active and they don't yet have the skills to work with people in ways that get them to want to help them or want to um, contribute to their success, which is a tremendous loss <laughs> to that company or to that family because people who are rebels are, you know, they're independent thinkers. Um, they, they spot uh, stuff that's, that's probably really going on. Uh, they have a, a, you know, acute sense of fairness. I mean, all these are wonderful qualities and they're wonderful qualities that uh, can, um, you know, be used in any kind of job. But I think it's important in whatever we do to see it from the other person's point of view. 
not because you are capitulating to them, but because you want to get as much of what you can get as you possibly can. And part of that, a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, is that you uh, want the other person to want to help you or want to support you. And a lot of times uh, where that comes in is that they experience you as a safe person. That is that they experience you as someone who is, uh, you know, fair and kind and um, willing to see things from their point of view. And that, that kind of getting along with a person or trying to find common ground or trying to work out something where they end up being a supporter of yours uh, instead of someone who is, you know, kind of uh, squaring off with you. Those kinds of skills are tremendously helpful. I mean, if you were a rebel in your own family system, and that was the best way that you found to um, deal with the dysfunction, then of course you may see yourself in that way in your job. You know, that, that if you notice the same dysfunction, you're liable to reach for the thing that made you feel like at least you had a, a, a handle on yourself, you know, at least you knew who you were. You would reach for that again, of course. But I'm just encouraging you, Jason, to also um, look at uh, learning some ways of working with people in a non excuse me, in a non-confrontational way that gets you more of what you want. And I don't look at that as playing the game. I look at it as I don't look at it as a sellout. I look at it as being um, very realistic about what is going to work to get you more of what you want. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing is that when we call out dysfunction, it tends to make other people much more defensive and much more dug in against us. So if you have an opportunity uh, not to learn how to, you know, kind of get more power, but learn how to work around and communicate non-confrontationally, but directly, you know, by stating what it is that you want, asking for help, which rebels sometimes have a hard time doing, um, then you get to uh, become more skillful in how you direct your action. You want to be a guided missile in your life traje trajectory. You, you don't wanna just be moving to be moving. You want to know what you're going after and use the most emotionally skillful way to get there. Awesome, thank you everybody. I know um, there's another questions, but I'll make sure to get that uh, answered next time. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Uh, such a pleasure always. And uh, we'll take a couple of weeks break and then we'll be back with you for two more workshops at the end of the month. So yeah, see you guys then.